I'm Dick Gooding, your host of Veterans Remember, a series of conversations with Hopkins and veterans who have served our country during peacetime and war. In our discussions, we hope to share with our viewers some of the experiences of our veterans who served during World War II, the Korean conflict, wars in Vietnam, the Gulf, Iraq, and currently in Afghanistan. They share with us their personal stories and the impact their service has had on their own lives, as well as on the lives of all of us today. I'm joined today by Jack Cahill, a Marine who served his country proudly during the Vietnam War. Jack, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, we've, we've, certainly, uh, we've certainly had an opportunity to talk with your dad on numerous occasions, and he's always the hit at the morning breakfast uh, once a month when we have to quiet him down because he can't hear Hank talking. That's for sure. But, uh, uh, Jack, I know you're a Hopkinton resident, I mean a Hopkinton original, but uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your, your time in Hopkinton and what led you to get involved with the service? Well. I knew from an early age that I was going to wind up in the Marine Corps, and my dad hung around with Bobby Lavoie and Pat Lynch, and I mean, tough guys there. So I think I always wanted to be a tough guy, like those guys. <laughs> and uh, so uh, it was uh, regular school uh, football, and. Uh, and uh, joining the Marine Corps. And you didn't. You didn't have any desire at the time to go to college, Jack. Actually, I didn't. Uh, I didn't think because you got to realize the times were. Uh, if you didn't go to college, you were going to get drafted in two years at the age of 19. So th that limited your options. I mean, you could hang around for two years and and uh, do nothing, or you could just get off your butt and go do something and. I joined with Mark Lumber and Bobby Shepard. We all went down to Boston and signed up. And uh, in September, I took off uh, for Paris Island. September of what year was this now? 66. Graduated 66. in uh, June of 66. We went down in June of 66 and signed up, and I was 17. Uh, and it was. Uh, to me, it was a good idea. So you headed down to uh, Paris Island for, for uh, basic? Paris Island for basic. Uh, did uh, eight weeks because they were uh, forming new divisions and they needed troopers fairly quickly. They, would, they had stopped the 12-week training process. Uh, so we learned how to do the marine things. And, uh, well, things were heating up in Vietnam at the time, but uh, yeah, it was 60, just 60. sort of... Yeah, well, still early in the. There was, they were calling up for new divisions, mm -hmm. and they wanted to fill the ranks fast. So, um, I was uh, pretty lucky in that. Uh, I figured I'd be a grunt, and uh, apparently, uh, Hank Baker and Ed Hayes and Mrs. Manning taught me how to read a map, and <laughs> how to read. And, how to write, so. And we know infantrymen don't know how to read maps. No. Yeah. So I wound up as a forward observer for naval gunfire. And uh, the first few months after boot camp, I was down in the Caribbean for a shoot, which is artillery and naval gunfire uh, jets. And uh, it's a little island off of Puerto Rico called Viegas. Viegas, oh yeah. That was in the news uh, oh, yeah. four or five years ago yeah. when they. They want it back. Yeah. But there's a lot of unexploded ordnance on that island, so I don't think they want it back, really. Is that where much of the training for uh, uh, marine artillery was conducted? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then got word in Vegas that I was going to have orders for Vietnam, and I really hadn't gone to any schools yet, so a sergeant took me under his wing and taught me everything he knew. And in a matter of a week, I was calling in fire missions, and, and uh, I was on my way. And this was for, for naval gunfire exclusively, or, or? Well, it's a naval gunfire. My primary MOS was naval gunfire. I see. Uh, but in conjunction with naval, we can do artillery, we can do mortars, we call in airstrikes. So it was anything to do with any big bombs blowing up, we could call them in. I think a lot of people didn't realize, uh, or perhaps even don't today, 
that an awful lot of the artillery uh, during Vietnam was stationed offshore on the battleships and... Oh, sure. We fired the Newport News off away. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you're doing some training and uh, getting ready, uh, getting your orders. Uh, how did that proceed? Um, it was, I was having a great time because it was like Boy Scouts. <laughs> just learning something new every day and having a, it was, I was interested. You know, they just wanted to be there. And they sent us out to uh, California to a jungle warfare school for a couple of weeks. And we flew Where in. Where was that, at Pendleton? Yes. Oh, okay. And then uh, flew into uh, Da Nang with orders for the 3rd Marine Division. And then somewhere along the line, those got changed. And I wound up with the 1st Marine Division and the 11th Marine Artillery Battalion. Now, the Marines were pretty much uh, clustered in the northern part of uh, the country, is that correct? Yeah, we ran from the DMZ down through Da Nang and then down south. Uh, uh, I forget the name of the years. That's probably if we were to but look at the north Johnny of Keenan was there. Yeah, the north of Vietnam, we'd probably see it's only like 25 or 30 miles, right? Yeah. We're was from the north of, uh, or from the demilitarized zone to the bulk of the operations for the Marines? Pretty much. Um, so I was about 20 miles outside Da Nang uh, with the 11th Marines. And uh, they'd, what they'd do is they'd go out on a search and destroy missions and would sweep from certain points and uh, would either be helicoptered into an area and then do a sweep, and our job was to s support the infantry. Uh, but you travel with the infantry oh, yeah. to be able to uh, well, direct fire. Hump the radio. I was right. a radio humper, and I was with sergeants who knew what they were doing, which was really good because I really didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and uh, we had, uh, I had a lot of time with the uh, line companies, uh, Bravo Company in particular. And Bravo Company's company commander would always have us walk through the rice paddies rather than up on the banks, because uh, that's where the booby traps were. And I'm carrying my radio and my pack and my M14 and my helmet, and all of a sudden I disappear in the rice paddy. <laughs> and my sergeant's right behind me with the radio cord in his hand is going, where did he go? Your antenna sticking up above the water, huh? And he just reached down and grabbed me and brought me up because there was no way I was getting out of that water. I just, you know, I fell into a shell hole. Huh. Now, were you uh, directing uh, not only uh, naval gunfire, but were you involved at all with Army artillery? No, we just fired Marines. You just uh, had to coordinate with, I assume, there were overlapping fields of fire with the Army as well, sure, right? absolutely, yeah, yeah. And hopefully they were well coordinated. But well, well, the other thing that you had to coordinate at the time was uh, the helicopters. We kept shooting mm -hmm. down the helicopters with our artillery. So we have this thing called a Sable Plane, which would take the, the direction of the battery firing the air traffic into consideration and try not to shoot down the helicopters, which is not good. Not so good. Now, the early parts, uh, or at least the beginning of your, your time in Vietnam, uh, although it was never fun over there, uh, it wasn't really the high, high time for uh, uh, large-scale activity. Is that well, correct? No. Every time we, we'd run into the, the VC, they'd always stay for a little while and then they'd disappear. And that's pretty much how it was the first six or seven months I was there. We never really, I mean, we fought them, and, mm -hmm. but they just left. And then in uh, January, well, let me back up a little. I started out in Da Nang, and then we got transferred up to Quang Tri about August, and then we got transferred down to Fubai at the end of November, the beginning of December, and we uh, we actually wound up in a, a huge base, on a base, before we'd been living in 
pup tents, and mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't real comfortable, especially when it started raining. Um, Which it did most of the time. <laughs> and it got cold, it got really cold. And uh, so they, they came down and said, uh, we're gonna have a truce for uh, the holiday around Christmas and the Vietnamese New Year, which the Lunar New Year is called Tet. And I had been transferred from one area to the Fire Support Coordination Center, which is a fancy name for an office job. And I uh, actually wound up meeting uh, the uh, military commander for the South Vietnam. Uh, really? Wow. Westmoreland. Mm -hmm. General Westmoreland came in, looked over my shoulder, saw I was doing a good job, and <laughs> rolled around. But, uh, and this was a Joint Forces uh, Fire Support Coordination Center? No, this was strictly for the Marines. Just Marines, He was okay. just riding around, checking things out, mm -hmm. and he was up in our I-Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, I well, don't even think we knew he was coming. He just showed up. Yeah. Well, shortly uh, after that, uh, you, you, you briefly alluded to Tet, the uh, Lunar New Year, which is uh, yeah. you know, celebrated heavily in, uh, in that neck of the woods. Uh, Tet of 68, in many respects, turned out to be you know, one of the turning points in the war because it was the first large-scale attack that the North Vietnamese and the v Viet Cong uh, had presented to us after, as you said, the, we thought things were scaling down. And uh, we were told, I know I was over there shortly after that, but we were told that uh, We'd taken away their will to fight, and uh, it wasn't going to be too long before things were over. Yeah. It was a little different than that, wasn't it? Yeah, a little bit. Why don't you explain a little bit about your experience with that? Well, being in the support center, uh, we had uh, recon teams out and did radio information into us, and we were, they were, tracking a uh, battalion of NVA that came down through Quang Tree and, and uh, they wound up losing them it somewhere. Dropped off the radar screen, huh? Yeah. It, well, it turned out we found them later. They were uh, hiding to the west, I believe, of Way City. Mm -hmm. And these are the guys that we wound up fighting at Way. And so, between the time at Quang Tree, which was around Christmas, we moved south to Fubai, and the uh, everything was quiet. There was a, I mean, it was really, really quiet. There was nothing was going on anywhere, and so that was the Christmas. And then uh, I was trying to jumpstart this little jeep when the. Uh, the guy got the clutch in and it popped, and then all of a sudden you could see that rocket coming in. Well, it was coming in two rows uh, distance from me. <coughs> Excuse me. And at uh, 12 o'clock, the guys were starting to line up for chow, and it took out it took out half of half of the guys lined up for chow. Really? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, you know, I've heard some stories, and maybe you can relate to it, but uh, I know a couple of times while I was there, uh, we had a lot of Viet South Vietnamese workers who were allegedly our friends, and every once in a while, none of them would show up to work, and, and that usually was coordinated with some sort of a, That's of exactly a Vietnamese. That's exactly what happened, yeah. Is yeah. that what happened? Yep. Nobody yeah. showed up for work, and we knew something was going to happen, but we didn't know what. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then... Uh, Uh, you have uh, s times when you do what you think you're supposed to do. And having been taught by the sergeants I was, when this tet started, uh, from then on it was a constant uh, shelling and uh, fights around the perimeter. 
And uh, one particular time I remember I, would, uh, I was in charge of the radio section and all of a sudden we started getting fire and it was coming in pretty close and we weren't in the bunker, we were outside. And all of a sudden I'm standing around and my Navy lieutenant is gone, my sergeant is gone, and I'm the only one there. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I knew what to do. I called in battery fire for the rocket places that we had already established where they're usually fired from. Counter fire, we call it. Got the counter fire going, got everything going according to the plan. And then after everything's over, my lieutenant comes back and starts chewing my butt. And the sergeant chews my butt because I should be in the hole with them. Could have gone in the bunker, huh? Yeah. It was just, here I was, I thought I was going to get a medal and I got chewed out. <laughs> but, well, that's something because uh, at the time uh, of Tet, uh, I think the, the attacks were primarily in the top half of the country of South Vietnam, Vietnam and all the major cities, Play Coup, Nha Trang, Ban Mi Tuat, Phan Thiet, uh, and of course all the Marine uh, outposts and then all along the, uh, had, had the border friend, area. Had a friend in Saigon and he was uh, at the embassy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took them a while to take back the embassy because the uh, NVA had gotten inside the compound. But yeah, um, on the third day of Tet Offensive, we were told we were going up to Way City. Uh, what we don't know, or we didn't know, was that battalion of NVA had gone from house to house in Way. And anybody who had an education or worked for the government was taken out to uh, the sand dunes on the eastern part of the uh, countryside. And they were shot and buried out in the uh, mm. sand dunes. And we didn't find them for months. I mean, just a huge population. Uh, side note was what, the first time I was in Way, it reminded me of Cambridge, Mass. It was just, it was, you could tell it was a college town, and all these guys are out there playing soccer and having a great time. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful city. And the next time we saw it, it was just a horror show. Uh, yeah, it had been, a, uh, I believe, a religious center. It was, uh, yeah, it was at one time, the, I think the it was, Citadel of yeah, Way yeah, was, it was uh, a capital uh, yeah, of the was, country. Yeah, the Citadel was something else. It was, hmm. Well, Tet, uh, you know, in, in retrospect, certainly, uh, uh, Tet of 68, when, when these attacks were launched all over uh, South Vietnam, you know, particularly up in the northern two cores, uh, our leaders had been telling people back in Washington that the will of uh, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese had been taken away and we were yeah. thinking about scaling back at the time and uh, uh, thinking that the war might have been over. And uh, I think uh, as, we re as we view it uh, in the rearview mirror, of course, which is always easier to do, uh, we certainly uh, had a massive uh, reaction here, back here in the States. And I think the, the tide of the people uh, really went against the war in Vietnam at that point because they felt like they'd been lied to and been told that everything was going great. Mm -hmm. And even though it was an overwhelming military victory for U.S. and, and South Vietnamese troops, uh, we certainly lost a lot of goodwill back here in the States. Well, when the bodies started stacking up at the MACV compound, um, we couldn't get them out. And the wounded uh, were the priority. So to, to see how many people we lost in a short period of time, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, we didn't have any air cover. Uh, I always thought <clears throat> we didn't have any air cover because of the weather, because it was the monsoon season. Well, I'm watching the History Channel. It turns out the Vietnamese government said we couldn't have air cover because they were afraid of the buildings being blown up. Right. And after about three or four weeks, that's when we started to get some air cover. But by then, we went gone through so many Marines. They were coming off the 
uh, plane in Cal from California. And usually you'd ease some people in to the situation. These guys were thrown right into it. I mean, you, you didn't even know their names because they were right. there for such a short period of time. Um, well, it was an extraordinarily difficult time, I think, for, for not only Marines up in the I-Corps, but uh, certainly everywhere in South Vietnam, the troops were, oh, absolutely. Uh, I think, were astounded by the, uh, the ability of the Arvin and the, excuse me, the uh, VC and the North Vietnamese to launch those attacks. Well, you must have left, you left country soon thereafter, after uh, Tet. Well, yeah, well, after Tet, well, not really, because what happened was um, the 26 Marines uh, were up at Quezon. And from the beginning of uh, the, uh, the offensive, they were surrounded. Uh, the Quezon fire base is a, a shallow bowl with mountains all around it, similar to Dien Bien Phu, which is what I think the North Vietnamese figured they'd keep these guys in there and uh, annihilate them. Mm -hmm. Well, I went through boot camp with a guy from Webster, Massachusetts named Ed Luida. And uh, when he, he got into country probably two months after I did because he was waiting for the 26 Marines to form up. And he was telling, writing me letters because you could write letters back and forth in country. This is a beautiful place. It's got fish, it's got wildlife, it's a rubber plantation, and it's just absolutely beautiful here. Well, he was a cook. The first day of the Tet Offensive, they took out his cook house, a big tent, so they put him in a line company, and he spent the rest of the offensive as a line company NCO. And uh, we actually got together at Quezon because I found his, uh, his uh, gunny sergeant and went over and met him in his hole. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, he did pretty well after that. He enlisted for a couple more years and wound up in the uh, embassy yeah. as a, a hmm. guard. Do you ever get together with him? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah? yeah, you do now? Well, I haven't seen him for a couple of years because yeah. he moved to Vermont. Mm -hmm. He's a... Uh, being quiet up there. Yeah. Well, after you left uh, Vietnam, you've had you had some interesting assignments. Can you uh, share that with us? Sure, well? absolutely. Uh, there's a battalion of Marines floating in the Caribbean, floating from port to port, which is a horrible thing to do. And then there's another one, another battalion in the Mediterranean, part of NATO. So for two years, I floated from terrible duty to terrible duty is a uh, beautiful was, ports in the Mediterranean beautiful huh? ports in the Mediterranean <laughs> it was absolutely unbelievable uh, uh, for a 19 year old kid seeing the world uh, I just can't re recommend it enough to anybody See, why didn't you that. why didn't you stay in the Marines if uh, you were having such a good time well you got to grow up sooner or later so I uh, they, the Marine Corps was cutting back, and they, they let me out early because I was a veteran. Mm -hmm. So I had six months left to do, and uh, they just, they were already starting to cut back. Mm -hmm. And that was 1970, 60, late 69, early 70. So I got out in February of uh, 70. Okay. And you came back to Hopkinton? Came back to Hopkinton. Yeah, and what did you do after you got out of the service? I went down to the unemployment office and uh, ran into a friend of mine, Michael DeLeo, and he said, Jack, you gotta tell him you wanna do something for work. I didn't know, I wanted to take the summer off. I, <laughs> I don't wanna do any work. So he said, yeah, well, figure out what you want. So, so I said, well, I flunked shop in f freshman year in high school. Uh, I'll be a plumber. Be a plumber. So I went down to the unemployment office and told him I want to be a plumber, and the guy thought for a minute and said, come back in two weeks. I might have something for you. Two weeks later, I was working for Ray Grenier in Sherburn and uh, never did get the summer off. 
But, uh, <laughs> uh, got married and had a kid and and uh, life was uh, life in the Hopkinton area is very good. Well, listen, uh, we really appreciate you coming up with us today and uh, sharing your experiences. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for joining us in this episode of Veterans Remember. And I thank Jack Cahill, son of World War II veteran Marine John Cahill, for sharing his experiences in the Marines during the war in Vietnam. Veterans Remember is a series of conversations with Hopkinton veterans who have served their country during wartime and peace. They have personally helped to preserve our freedom and have made numerous contributions to the town of Hopkinton. I want to thank you very much uh, for everyone, and thank you, Jack. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I want to be a pediatrician. Uh, I was hoping to become a chef someday. As long as there's somebody behind you pushing you and supporting you, then you feel that you always have the strength to keep going. So get involved and do your part. Invest in the future. Mentor a child. Hello, welcome to HKM Insights. Did you know that Hopkinton's television station has a sister website called seeninhopkinton.org? This site hosts online photo albums of everyday life and events in our community. Town residents have contributed thousands of photos of school events, holiday happenings, storms, and life. So far, we've had over 250,000 views of the photos, so if you haven't been there, check it out. And think about sending in your own scene.